you want to say something? Sure. Well, um, Jesper and I realized we spent the last two days uh, in the networking uh, microconference, which uh, really was a lot about XDP. So we decided the last minute we would just do this practical introduction. Um, yeah, we, 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 we heard this thing like XDP is really cool. So we like we found this stuff on the internet and we've downloaded it and played a little with it. Let's see. Uh, it's been a busy 24 hours. <laughs> uh, we thought we would do that. So, uh, no, but yeah, as you said, I'm Andy Gospodar. I'm from Broadcom. Yeah, I'm Jesper. Yeah, and uh, I do know what XDP is, so I sort of invented it. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, yeah. So, so we, we really want you to get something out of this. So it's sort of a tutorial. So we want we want you to learn something. We want you to, when you go out of here, actually know what this XDP stuff is, and also to explain how what's the relationship with with BPF for you. It will teach you all about the fundamental elements you can use, and it will show you real program code. I used you to be able, from going away from this talk, be able to write code for the XDP and understand this stuff. You're also going to touch some of the advanced concepts, and at last we're going to talk about also the like for the driver developers because we, we need this to be adapted in more drivers. So we actually have some slides of how do you actually code this up in your driver, and yeah, let's see how much you'll learn. All right, so first of all, we'll start off, what is XDP? So um, it's really just a, a well, maybe new, not anymore, but it's still new to a lot of folks, and, and that's okay. Uh, it's a new programmable layer in the kernel network stack. Uh, it's runtime programmable. Really is targeted at BPF as packet processing. So the important key to remember is that last, in the, the orange there, it is not kernel bypass. So yes, you get to do it before the kernel stack does things, but it is not kernel bypass. You're in line with the kernel, all of the many fun features available in the Linux kernel are, are, are available to you. Um, and, and programs, it's a little bit unique. They're compiled to a platform independent uh, eBPF, e which by the way, we're just gonna say BPF the whole time because eBPF is just yeah, about that, impossible to pronounce. That's a mouthful, right? uh, uh, yeah, in any reasonable amount of time. So um, don't be alarmed if we leave the E off for most of this time. Uh, but yeah, compiled into a bytecode. One of the really cool things about it being platform independent is as you might imagine, you can actually run the same compiled BPF binaries on ARM, on x86, they all work. It's pretty cool. Um, and and that's, that's one of the real powers. If you want to deploy it uh, fast or deploy it multiple places, you can. Uh, I know there was a discussion earlier today about the fact that there are some, some caveats for compiling some of your user space code that loads this. It's dependent on uh, the kernel version you're running. Uh, Alexei and others at Facebook are looking at, at working around that. So you can have one binary that Maybe you could run on multiple versions across your fleet uh, without much trouble. So also, uh, we've got kind of the, the key design goals. Yeah. Like you want to say something, go ahead. Yes, so, so, so to sort of the, 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 the design when I started this project was really to, to close the performance gap to the, to the kernel bypass solutions. That has been sort of my mo motivation to, to, to compete with, with DBDK because I was not, th I was thinking that the, we are comparing apples and oranges, uh, oh, how, how you, you say it, like, because- yeah, That's correct. That's, that's, yeah. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I was really thinking it was unfair, this performance comparison against the Linux network stack and DBDK. So, but now we are operating at the same level as, as DBDK and now we can actually compare XDP against DBDK, what's the performance gap. And my real motivation is closing the gap, but it's actually not to be faster than than the, the, the kernel bypass stuff. I'm fine with like, if I have a 20% gap or something, then as, as long as I have a more generic solution to, to this problem instead of bypassing the whole kernel. And like DBDK, we operate on, on these directly on the packet buffers. Uh, that was sort of my original name for XDP, but some Tom Herbert came up with a much better name called XDP instead of packet buffers. Remember, Tom claims too that X is the fastest letter, and that was why he liked XDP. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we operate on the packet before converting it to the to the our metadata structure called SKB, and and this is one of the points why why the network stack is conceived to be slow is because the network stack up front, we took the decision 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, that, that these, these packets, they should be, live, they be delivered into sockets. That's why it's called the SKB, because it's the socket buffer. And, and we sort of realized that if you want to do something fast, you don't take the, this cost up front. If you don't need it, you can use XDP in this, these use cases. Another important design goal is that we want to be able to work 
in concert with the network stack. So XDP is, in fact, not a kernel bypass, but it's a bypass of the, the network stack. But we want to cooperate with the network stack and fall through to the network stack when we, we, we find a packet we will not handle in XDP, but we can handle pa package faster at another, at another level. And we'll, we'll talk about this some more too, but not only can we fall, out, fall back to the kernel stack if we need to, there's work underway to take current kernel data structures that exist and allow us to inspect those and find out if we can make a forwarding decision based on already well-known data. So we end up with uh, essentially being a, a new fast path, if you will, for the kernel, yeah, uh, yeah. if you'd like. We have, we have another slide where we have more things. We'll talk about so, that more, yeah. it's a teaser. So another important design goal is like the flexibility. Like with DBDK, we, they steal the whole whole uh, net card, and we are we are not doing that with XDP. We are we are putting in a filter, and we even have now per per receive queue we can do just know what receive queue we are ha handling this stuff on, and and do like zero copy into user space and advanced stuff. But we are not taking the whole NIC. That that is part of the flexibility of this. So you want to talk kernel? Yeah, so uh, there are really two ways to think about XDP, uh, two different kernel hooks. Uh, the one that we really care the most about is the native mode XDP. So um, this has a driver hook. Uh, typically, it happens just after the buffer is uh, DMA'd uh, and made available. Um, it's before SK buffs are allocated. So you're really operating on, on raw information. Uh, we're not waiting for the memory allocator, allocation to happen. Um, in this case, this is gonna give us the, the opportunity to have the smallest number of actual instructions executed before we start inspecting the packet. That's really actually the power of the DPDK is that they're not doing anything except going, is there a packet, is there a packet, is there a packet? And when there is, you do something and then move on. So there's a really small number of instructions executed per packet process. Um, now, one of the downsides to this, hence it's listed in what should be read, um, is that there's a, there is driver modification required to use this mode. So there's a limited number of drivers that currently support all the, all the operations. Um, but this is the highest performance mode. Just remember, this is the smallest number of instructions that are executed before operating on a packet. The other mode, uh, which some people call it SKB mode or generic XDP mode, it was actually born out of a uh, conference about a year ago. Uh, Dave was really excited about XDP and really encouraged people to think about can we have something native and uh, I think before the conference was over, Dave had produced a patch. And, yeah, and, um, and, and sort of the point is that, that with generic XDP or XDP uh, mode, you, you can, it, it works on any net device. That's right. So, so you just did a little bit on your laptop because, you, so the problem is that with the hardware solution, you have to have tested on the server that has this expensive that's hardware, right. right? But with with the generic mode, it's a simulated mode of XDP with the with with the, the SKB. So we do tricks to make it look like this is like the XDP mode. That that allows you to to, to develop your program on your laptop, uh, really, and just test it on, on on your own NIC without really having to 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 load your program every time on the server. And then when you are done with your program, you load it on the real server. That's right. Because and that's where you get one to performance. The great thing is, uh, because there's such a larger number of instructions that are executed um, before running these programs, uh, you, you get great justification for, for doing this native mode, doing the development, because you realize the performance gap is huge. Um, I mean, it's, it's really massive. Uh, I mean, granted, um, yeah, so we, you, you, could, you could do this, but, but yeah, native mode is, is the way to go. Um, yeah. Where's, oh, here. So ultimately, do you expect basically all network drivers to eventually have native mode to be modified to use that? Yes, um, yes, that's that's yeah. what I'm hoping for. Okay, at least. So, so uh, there's no there's no fundamental on some network drivers devices no. can do it and some cannot. No, uh, you, yeah, like, like if it, this is all, this is a software thing, so you should be able to support an in uh, network right. driver. So and are you expecting that basically it's going to be built into the driver? API so that you're not doing have duplicating this stuff all the way through on every driver or so are you expecting framework changes? Well, there there are already I mean there are new NDO ops that already exist to handle uh, the insertion of the program and then to handle transmit. Yeah. Uh, um, so I mean yet yeah, that's there you just need to fill out. I think we're we're going to discuss what actions you have and I think it's quite complete now, and 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 the way that there's an advanced topic 
uh, that we are going to cover, right? We are going to do this redirect, and we have a way to ex extend the types of redirects we can do without having to change the drivers. So we, we, we have to have a core set of the actions and drivers, and then we can evolve in, 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 in the core. I even have crazy plans of actually removing the SKP allocation completely from drivers and making it happen in the core. So that's like, like uh, I don't know how, how many roads, uh, or years down the road, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, going back to the last slide, is there any advantage to running gem generic mode? Is it only useful for testing, or is it still better performance than using it, the entire kernel stack? Uh, it, it should be used as testing. Uh, it is quite fast, actually, uh, because we, we are doing it quite early before invoking the, 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 the rest of the network stack. So you can actually drop package quite fast there. But it, I, I, I don't want to recommend doing that. And also another quick question. For the native mode XDP, um, is anything like that, does it make sense to run it on Amazon boxes, or is it only designed for like standalone, ultra high speed sort of? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kicking the guys from Amazon to actually implement it and then promise they will, they will do it. So. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, I also have a question about the generic mode. So, um, Can you talk more into the? More? Like this? Yes. yes. OK, I see, OK. <laughs> Um, so I really like the generic mode because I use it for prototyping, visual switching, yes. whatever, building awesome. topologies. And it's quite useful for generic emulation purposes. And there's a bunch of problems with clone packets. Yes, uh, there's, there, there's actually some bugs in the... Uh, so we're not covering bugs mode. in this talk. We're not covering bugs. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just wondering, if there, is, there, is there any write-down about the limitations of the generic mode compared to the native no, mode? No, I, I just have to fix those bugs. I know okay, that. Yeah, I see. Sorry. Okay. Any of the limitations are not intentional. Yeah, okay, I see. Okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, thank you. So XDP and BP, EBPF or BPF, they, they are quite connected and sort of very interconnected. So we do, do depend on it, and how is this disconnected? So if, if you see it as, as XDP, how is, you can see it as a data plane and a control plane. So how is, if you view it in, with, with these, these goggles on, how, how, how would it look? So the data plane is still inside the kernel, but it's split into two things. One is the, the sort of the core network part that is, uh, in charge of moving packets quickly. L a lot of it actually happens down in the drivers of, of making it moving fast, but it's still kernel code. And then we have the attached BPF program, which is the policy logic. You get to decide the action or fate of the packet, and you get read write access to the packet buffers. And the control plane is, is done, done from user space. So you, you're, you're obviously, you have to load it from user space, but you can also control the behavior of your program from user space through maps. And we'll get into uh, David Ahern's idea of where let's look up in kernel tables instead by help us. But everything from the user space goes through the system call to, to control this. So that is the split. So we, we are not a bypass, right? We don't bypass it into the, the user space and have that. That's, that as our control plane, as, as our data plane, but our data plane is in the kernel. So that's, that's to frame that. Um, are you taking this one? Yeah, I'll do this one. So, um, so really the, the way to just think about it is we've talked about this before, sort of shouldn't be a surprise, but, but this driver hook is the one that's executing this, this eBPF bytecode. So this is, this is what we talked about, these BPF programs. Um, there really aren't any restrictions uh, on how it's generated or loaded. Um, it attaches uh, this BPF file descriptor, and we'll, we'll kind of go through a little bit of a code walkthrough on this too. But, it attaches it and um, creates the maps. Uh, all of this happens through the BPF syscall. Uh, so yeah, so some of the point is that you could do handwritten EPPF instructions and, and put it in, but it's really not practical. I have seen code doing this. Actually, System D has an array of, of like, hard-coded instructions and, and pushes this in. And uh, if, you've, yeah, if you've ever looked at, um, for example, there's a spanning tree daemon that uh, opens a raw socket, and there's actually BPF bytecode that's cryptically written that makes sure that only BPDUs come up uh, on that raw socket. So there's, there's BPF bytecode that's already, that's been in the kernel for a while. If you've used TCP dump before and filtered, that's BPF bytecode. So this is a, yeah. a fairly 
you know, well-known you know, construct and virtual machine in the kernel that's existed yeah, but, for a but while. But we, we want to recommend using LLVM and Clang to actually generate this right. bytecode. Don't write it by hand. I mean, if you have a lot of spare time and you really <laughs> want to write these by, this bytecode by yourself, feel free. But really, the best way to think use these is with BCC tools and, and using libbpf to help load these things, um, these objects created by, by LLVM. <coughs> So, uh, so we're going to focus on uh, on a few things that are in samples BPF in the kernel source tree. Uh, we're going to look at the restricted C code, uh, typically that makes up is compiled into the BPF bytecode, uh, is in a, a file underscore kern dot C. That's the typical convention today. Um, it's restricted. Uh, the idea is you can protect the kernel. There's uh, you know discussions about you know is BPF harm is is BPF harmful? Is it not? Uh, fairly well assumed right now, and everybody feels very confident that BPF is safe to use. Um, but to verify, that put, puts the, different restrictions on it, so that's, so right, that's why we call it restricted C. It's restricted in part, uh, the verifier makes sure. You, can, you cannot do loops, but people are working on like basic stuff, but, but you, you yeah. Can't, you, can't, you can't go on, there's buffer overruns and underruns, uh, or overruns shouldn't be a problem. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, uh, and how you, how you code slightly differently to deal with that. Uh, the other thing is that we, um, compile these these into ELF objects, and this, so this kern.c becomes kern.o. Surprise, surprise. And then we can use libbpf uh, to load. Uh, this is the data plane, the XTP data plane that, that Jesper was referencing a minute ago. So we'll load that uh, XTP data plane program using the user space control plane program that is conveniently named user with the underscore user.c. Um, and this will load the load the programs, uh, make sure the maps initialized, access the maps if needed. So. The great thing is, if you have a kernel source tree available, um, you've got these BPF samples already available. Uh, I think there is an interest in packaging uh, some of these samples yeah. for distros uh, as individual uh, RPMs or DEBs. Uh, there are other distros that have yeah. them already in them. And I, I also have a GitHub repository, so we can build it out of, out of tree if that's you don't right. want to have the kernel source. That's right. Uh, and, and yeah, there's, there's a lot more tooling stuff going on, right? All right, so we'll talk about the basic building blocks uh, that you need to, to get moving. Um, so yeah. this, uh, this was sort of what, what Grant was hinting at. What, what kind of like, actions do you actually have? And do we expect also if we expect more, right? So, so yeah, you uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk sorry. about the first so, one. Yeah, so there are sort of highlighted uh, halfway in yellow here. You can see we have drop, pass, TX, abort, and redirect. And we sort of at this point feel as though these are the complete set of operations that are needed. Uh, you can handle almost any other operation with these. Uh, drop's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the packet is just completely dropped. These make for the most amazing benchmarks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> however, the, you know, what, what Bjorn re revealed to us this week, interestingly enough, right, is that um, uh, even if you can't drop as fast as some other tool, when you're actually performing real transformations on packets or doing real inspection or doing real counting, um, things start to level off pretty well. Yeah. But I, uh, I actually see the XTP drop as, as a really good test of the hardware. And <laughs> this, is fact, a, this is my hardware test to make sure it, that like, what, what hardware did I get? Do they, can they actually perform at these speeds? And, and, so. <laughs> and in fact, that's exactly what I did not a week ago. I had some new hardware. I wanted to see, can we hit the limits that we thought we could? And uh, Really good hardware evaluation tool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a hardware evaluation tool. Right? Yeah, that's right. It, <laughs> it, it absolutely is, and people people use other tools for that as well. But I, of, of, I was of, able of to. Course, of course, Cloudflare actually uses it for, for for the DDoS protection uh, and right. the production for that, and so does Facebook for their uh, protection for against DDoS attacks. For those curious, by the way, that maybe weren't in the talk earlier this week, I think the number was since May 2017, every packet that's gone to Facebook.com has been filtered by an XDP program. Yes. Uh, so that's pretty, pretty amazing uh, deployment. Um, all right, we'll continue. So we've got the benchmark, the amazing benchmark creator, XTP drop. So we have XTP pass. So this is where we, this is one of the key things that XTP has that we don't get with other things like DPDK. So packet inspection can happen. You can verify it's an okay packet. You can do whatever and say, all right, sounds great. Move it up to the kernel tree. And uh, that's exactly what XTP pass does. Uh, so it's fairly lightweight, um, as lightweight as your program is, um, but in general, just lets it go back up the stack and continue to progress as needed. Uh, the other one is XDP TX, or transmit. So uh, this will take the packet. You can possibly perform transformation on it if you want. Send it immediately back out the same port on which it was received. Uh, this is the, the classic case that people have for a load balancer or a, um, 
Uh, maybe even you could think of it as a sort of a, I mean, people used to talk about a router on a stick a long time ago. That would, that would certainly be uh, the case here. Um, also, another good test of what the hardware can do. Uh, you sp spread this out amongst multiple cores, and you can start to see you know, how, much, how much can your hardware handle. Uh, but also has a lot of good applications, especially in a packet transformation case. It's quite good to test the PCI bandwidth limits. And you can also do that, too. <laughs> um, you can benchmark your NIC and your server all with one app. Um, so the other thing is XTP aborted. So this is a case that's actually not very different from XTP drop. Uh, there's a variety of reasons why you might, in your program, choose to say, I don't want this packet is invalid. Some error happened. Maybe you don't have. There's a variety of reasons. But the biggest difference between drop and aborted is uh, we demonstrate the ability to um, populate the trace buffer to say that, that something happened. Yeah, so there's, there's a trace point you can attach to, to when you want to debug your program. So it's, it's, it wouldn't affect performance before we actually attach to the trace point. It also has zero cost. That's right. Uh, but you get to know something happened. So there is, there is the opportunity to escape from this uh, BPF layer and, and provide some information uh, to the to the developer or system administrator. Um, uh, and the last one, uh, and the most uh, amazing and interesting and useful one, is XTP redirect. So the redirect idea is that you can uh, redirect to another port, if you like. You can, uh, Jesper's got some tricks he'll talk about a little bit later. You can redirect yeah. to other CPUs yeah. uh, to handle things. So there's an opportunity to take a packet in, send it somewhere else. Um, and re uh, redirect is also used for the AF XTP, where we redirect into user space. That's right. Uh, more, more about that later. So, so and one, the one thing I will mention too for those people that have used DPDK or are familiar with it, uh, the, the sort of parallel analogies, uh, TX and redirect are very similar to the actions you might get if you use DPD, DPDK tools where you uh, have the, uh, the L2, um, L2 TX, one of, the, one of the DPDK tests, I swear I've run it before. Um, where I think you, it's the test PMD, which... Yeah, if you, run the, if you run test PMD and you choose the L2 forwarding to be the... Uh, you're just, that's the name of the test, L2 forward. Um, if you had one port in there, that'd be the equivalent of the XTP TX, just bring the packet in, send it back out. If you actually had two uh, physical PCI functions associated with it uh, and did the L2 forward, that'd be the equivalent of, of the L XTP redirect operation or one of, the, one of the things redirect can do. Yeah, I, I want to cover the net next one. Sure. But so, so, we so how can you actually cooperate with the network stack? So, the, so the, the, the power of being able to modify the packets is quite, quite, quite uh, good because we, even though the XTP pass seems like, oh, you just want to pass it onto the stack, but because you can pop and push headers and modify them, you actually get the opportunity to actually to change and in fact, if, if the kernel doesn't know a specific on-wire protocol, you can, you can map it, remove it, or map it into something the kernel actually understands. I think you had a good use case for actually. Yeah, so we, ca we came across something pretty recently uh, where uh, in-band network telemetry, or INT, is becoming uh, interesting and popular in some cases. And uh, when we first started looking at this, there wasn't kernel support uh, for it. And so the opportunity presented itself where we could uh, make sure to inspect those headers uh, remove those headers if needed and continue to pass that packet up the stack. And it gave us the opportunity to do something quickly uh, that we couldn't do before. And it. Uh, you, we, we, you didn't have to change the kernel. I didn't have to change the kernel. And like, also, I had support for the kernel. You could actually just right. fix it uh, before it, the kernel network stack got this with some software and actually used the in, the in band telemetry for, for something, right? Right. And it was extremely yeah. quick to develop. Real useful for a demo. It was awesome. Yeah. So an another thing, how to you can com communicate different stuff is like we have this this metadata area. You can when you have tail calls, you can actually you can if if you do some operation, you want to store this information about you did some passing of the packet or some other metadata you want in another stage. You don't have to repeat the same thing. So you can you have 32 bytes to communicate maybe to TC. The, and, and you can attach another BPF hook there, which can, can take this information and use that. For example, I have an example where, where I'm in the kernel tree that where I set the SKB mark uh, from XTP. You, you figure out this is a bad packet or something. You, you mark, you can actually put the metadata, you, the TLS, uh, the, 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 the TC hook uh, picks this up, put the mark on the SKB, and, and then you can add a net filter that uh, rule that matches on this mark. So you can actually communi communicate different stuff down the, down the network stack uh, this way. Um, Quest on oh. Hold on, wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Wait for the box. Yeah. 
can we do the forward marking on the transmit path, like uh, which gives some sort of a hint to the TC at the egress? On the, no, there's, there's clearly no, no egress. Yeah. Then I'm going to put a guide to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so and then, then we also have the, you can call helpers to, this is because from the BPF code you cannot call random kernel functions, you have to export this as a helper first. And, and this, this actually the, the, the so getting documented. So let's touch on that real quick before we go to the next slide. Um, so I think one of the things too that, that using BPF gives us is that we do have. We, 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 we do need to speed this, speed this up. And oh, okay. I'm, I'm taking executive <laughs> <laughs> because. We'll, we'll talk about the helpers here. And because this is we actually have uh, helpers here. Yeah, so, so one of the ideas with, with the helpers, what you, could, what you could do, and this is basically David Ahern's talk, so you can go watch that. <laughs> but, but it is, so the, 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 but the basic fundamental idea is that you should see XTP as a software upload because you want to cooperate with the network stack and you just configure the net, existing, existing network stack as you want and then you, you, have, you, you have XTP to accelerate only part of it, the, the fast path, and we could fall down to, uh, to, to and, and, and call pass on the packets that we, we cannot accelerate in the fast path to let the network stack handle those. And IP routing is a good example, which, which uh, as mentioned, David implemented. And we, we made a, a, a lookup function, which allows us to look up in the route table. And so we can actually like, accelerate route, route lookups. But I can see we're running out of time, so go watch the David's talk. So because what you really want to see is code, right? Yeah, this so is the audience wants to see. see yeah. <laughs> All right. That's pretty. I actually expect you to be pretty cool, yeah. quiet. Then, but the, try one yeah, more time. Let me come, come. that. Okay. Yeah. Come on. Yay, coffee. All right. Yeah. So, um, so here's a pretty simple example of uh, this restricted C code, uh, and just a simple uh, inspect to see if it's UDP. If it is, drop it on the floor. Um, so. Um, one of the cool things about this that we get is we're not writing all of our application libraries from scratch again every time we do uh, a BPF program. You can see we, at the very top there we've got struct eth header because we're including, we can include kernel header files. So we have information about how big some of these structures are. Uh, we also then, and I'm just going to kind of walk over here because I have long yeah. arms and pointed stuff. Um, so then we also have, uh, we can get size of structures. We can see we also can just access right into the structure because we've cast it to to this struct eth header. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much how we actually write kernel code. That right. We cast a structure down on the... Right, you're not, you don't have to go to the top of your file and define some fake new function that you've defined, or fake new structure that you've defined 15 times in other apps you've written. You just get to use what's there for the kernel. Now, in this case, one of the interesting nuances that you might see is the very first thing we do is we, we get a pointer to the data, uh, we get a pointer to the end of the data, and then we try to figure out is the data uh, further out than, than whatever our network offset is. So in other words, do we have enough space to look for this? This is a, a place that's, think this is code that's put in there for the BPF, the eBPF verifier. So this is a boundary check. So almost everything you do, any memory you access, you need to provide a check to the verifier first. Uh, yeah. Anyone so, who's- So you, you should really do this kind of boundary checks, right? But, right. But we often forget them, but you cannot forget them here because then the verifier comes and slaps you. That's right. Like and it, if you forget your boundary checks, it's, this is this is like you have to do this for security reasons, right? But right. often I, you, you forget them. But I've actually a couple of times written code and actually forgot these uh, boundary checks. And I was like, no, my code is correct. But the verifier says, no. Yeah, like, yeah. No, my code is no. And then I check it. Okay, I forgot yeah. the boundary check. Hugely, You're right. Right. I even, I even ended up writing to Daniel saying, if this code doesn't work, and he said, yes, but are you really sure? Try, <laughs> actually try to read your code, you're doing, you're actually the verifier is correct. <laughs> you, you, you fucked up. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it's rare the verifier is wrong. Uh, it does happen, but uh, especially based on the maturity we have today. So, so what we see right now, too, is we, we do a quick, so we check the, the length, and then we go and we say parse IPv4. So let's take a look at that function. I think it's on the next slide. Yes. So here's another great example. We've sort of shown another way uh, using some pointer math to uh, check to make sure that whatever we're looking at is something we can actually access. Uh, another key thing to think about here, when we're, whenever we're coding something, we very typically we just say, all right, you know, here's a new header, it's pointed at this data, and then we just go ahead and automatically access the structure element. Well, here we've got to remember, it's not actually that we need to care just about the pointer, it's the pointer, it's the end of the pointer, the end of the structure that we care about. So we do our 
IPH plus one for fun pointer math tricks to uh, appease the verifier. And then we can just return IPH protocol and we, and we can, yeah, and, we can and, do a check. And, and, and the plus one here for, for, not, for people who you don't usually code C is that what plus one is because this is a pointer to a struct, so it's, we advance the, the struct size of the struct once. So, so, so people that don't read C code that much, so we had a full comment for that. Yeah, but, but the, what the point of here is also that this stuff gets inline. So we, we, we do do function, simple function calls in our code, but we have to inline them because this is one of the restrictions for, 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 for BPF that, that we don't have function calls, which is not completely true because we just added function calls. But, uh, <laughs> but generally, this is what, what you will do. Let's about what's available today, though. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Let's move on. Let's, yeah, so we have, yeah. So yeah, there's a new, uh, libbpf is uh, really been- This is, been this is the, the, the library we want to standardize on. That's right. It is, it is available in the kernel suite. We are discussing with, with different uh, distributions how we actually, is, we, could, we could ship this with, together with the dis different distributions to make it a little bit easier. But right now, it's, it's primarily in the, in the kernel tree, this libbpf, and it's used by perf, it's used by Shurikata, it's used by the samples, it's used by the testing, so there's different uses of it, and it will be, shipped by the distributions, hopefully. So as you remember from our example earlier, we talked about how the, the, the BPF code is actually in these underscore kern.c and objectfiles.o. So here you can see we've got a file. This is our pre-compiled uh, BPF program, uh, xdp1 underscore kern.o. We're just gonna, we specify the type that it's xdp, and then we literally just call this uh, function right here, this part of libbpf, that loads it for us. And the, the return we get back is a pointer to the object and a pointer to the file descriptor. Uh, yeah. That are they're ready so, for us to use. Yeah, so so the the handle is, is a file descriptor as we've always known it from Unix. This is our handle to the program. And uh, this is uh, this, this is just a, another example. Um, it is a little bit more advanced, but it's it's because you could actually add at, at, I said the whole thing has to be in line, but you can actually have an elf object with multiple programs within that pro that uh, your, your C file, if, if you want to load, the, depending on what you want, what you want to, you can load the different sections of, of the BPF program. If this is just an example of how you, you, would, you would do that if you have several programs within one elf file. So w with That's a it. given interface, can you have multiple programs loaded at once? No. Okay, so it's only no, but, one at a time. Yeah. So, but but the reason I'm I'm showing this yeah. is you, you you can have multiple programs loaded because it's but in each different hooks and it depends on the beef. But if with XDP, you can only have one program loaded. But what I'm using in some of my programs is that I am I have a XDP program, but I also have a trace point program to to actually catch errors. So I'm in the same C file. I will both have the program that I want I want to attach to the to 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 catch the the XDP aborted, for example, or another trace point which handles errors. Um, so attaching this, this XDP program to something. <clears throat> so now that we've got it loaded, you probably remember uh, earlier we had uh, progfd had, had, uh, was a file descriptor that, that we had for this, this program. So now we can say, all right, just set the uh, BPF set link XDP FD. Pretty simple. We, we, uh, translate the name uh, using if name to index, uh, attached to the if index, and uh, there we go. Now we're off and running, uh, yeah. and we are attached. Um, so, so now what the, the code that's in the section um, associated with that in XTP current.o is attached to our ETH0 device, and every time a packet arrives, it goes, it goes through that code. Yep. So we also have to explain a little bit about how you actually use these maps. This was sort of you can use it for the control plane. You can also use it to store other information. But so we have to, like, how, how, what, what are, how does it look when you have want to add a map? So this is um, on, on the BPF side, on the, on the, kern, the underscore kern. Uh, so this is how you define a map. Uh, and, and this is just a struct that gets picked up by the section maps. And, and then we have the, while, while you're executing the BPF program, your access is like that. You can do a lookup in the map, and in this case, we are we, we, we are just using it as a counter, and here we're just doing plus one. But because we have because we have this per, the per per, per, per CPU, CPU array, as I stretch. so we, we we are we are allowed just to do a plus one. So there's no concurrency issues here. It does say in the comment that if 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 it is a basic array, you you obviously have to have some synchronization here. 
at some atomic operations, and you can use the shrink, fetch, and add uh, operation. But we'll sh show. What's kind of amazing is we're talking about such a few number of instructions to actually do transformations on these packets that just the simple optimization of using a per CPU array instead of one array that needs to take a lock across all CPUs makes a huge difference. I mean, a tremendous difference. So uh, it's important to think about how, in this case, with the we're offloading the, the work of, of summing these stats to the control plane because yeah. that's not I'm, part I'm of your I'm showing that in the, the next, no, not the, not the slide, the next one. Uh, but but so, so how do, you, do we get from user space, how do we get a, a hold of, of, the, of the map, of the file description? So, so we, uh, when, when, when you are the program that loaded this, uh, we, you have this, this libbpf function where you can actually find, find the map by name. Uh, you can also, some of the older programs, we also assume that we always take index zero of the map, but actually now we have a little bit nicer that you actually look up by name so you don't make mistakes about and or have implicit assumptions of, of in the, the, the order you define the maps in. Some of the sample codes still have this, the, the older method of assume, having assumptions about the, the order of the defines in, in, the, in, 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 in the kernel file. Yeah. You get a mic. So there's no file descriptor associated with that that I can see. So is the namespace that you're looking up? No, this is, this is so this is the object I have up, up here. So the object is a, is a libbpf object that I'm, I'm asking for this. So this is this is the this is the the, the program that loaded the, the the so. But but what you get back out is a is a file descriptor. You can actually get this file descriptor in, in another way. Uh, querying, but we are not going into that. So now we have the this is the, the this is the user space code. Does that make sense? This is okay. the user space right. code that is yeah that you should mention that. That's quite important. Uh, so now I have have the file got the file descriptor. Now and I, I I need to read this information out. And as Andy has hinted that because we have the per CPU stuff, it makes the complication a little bit more more trouble. Like we have to do more work in, in user space now because we have. We have to take the, the number of possible CPUs and actually do the, 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 the lookup of the elements and get the value out. We, we will have a, a counter per CPU. And as, as you can see up here, we have, uh, we, we have to have a small for loop to actually sum this up. So, and, and, and we sort of get the benefit of performance on the kernel side, but we have to do a little bit more on the user space side. Uh, to, to, to sum this up. And that, that is sort of a good op optimization to, to push a little bit more work on the user space than on the, on the, on the fast path. Do you want anything more about this? No. Um, I think we probably got to hustle, too. Um, so when we... Uh, yeah, we, we, yeah. We, we, we let's, let's keep going. So that's the this we'll skip advanced, to the advanced concepts. concepts. So we have the redirect action, which is, is sort of a special one. And I'm sort of hoping that this will be, we will be the last action because we can, we can, by redirecting, we are redirecting into maps that gives us flexibility to invent new bulking code, uh, or not bulking code, new, new, new code uh, that, that, that can extend without changing the drivers anymore. The redirect also hides bulking. Uh, uh, so yeah, you have to remember to use the redirect map call that activates bulking. Uh, but I can see we have like four minutes left. Right. So there's different types of maps. Uh, there's, that's all, all yeah, fun, and, but, but let's yeah. move on to, I really want to. So if you're to, a Nick driver developer, this is kind of the key slide for you. If you currently don't have a driver that supports XDP, you're going to need to think about implementing uh, these different operations. So this is a, a real trimmed down version. Uh, I fit in a whole slide. This is I, what you need to do yeah, in the driver. Is, yeah. yes, this you, is it. I can so fit you, in a driver. Come all you on. need to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we've, you can see we've got the five options we talked about there, the, or the five actions we talked about. Um, ideally, it will take you more than one line of code to implement the, 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 the code to just do the transmit or to do the redirect action. But this can fit in a, a fairly small space inside your nappy, your nappy pole handler uh, to do this. Um, and then the, the key with all this is that, or some of this, as, as Jesper mentioned, uh, there's a bulking operation that's available, uh, which gives us another huge performance boost. When we're doing these rapid transmits, you don't need to necessarily uh, write the doorbell for your NIC every single time to make sure every single yeah. packet's sent. You can s send a few of those, then write the doorbell. Uh, yeah. So, so for, from, from the NIC driver, they usually process one packet at a time. So we, we made an API where, where we still simulate that we are processing one packet at a time, but we actually achieve bulking 
by combining this, we have this flush operation and in the end, we, yeah. that is sort of the key that we, 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 do, yeah. we do the flush. Write everything down to the driver at once, write the doorbell, package because it Because there's the a wire. huge performance impact of, of doing bulking, of doing receive bulking, but we are hiding this behind a little bit at another interface so we don't have to make the drivers more complicated. By huge, I can say 40%, yeah. like legitimately. That makes a huge difference. Yeah. Everybody's asked me about this. Like, what is the restriction for the driver model? So we used to have like the requirement of one page uh, per, per per receive frame. That is no longer true because until they in their drivers they are having one page and they're having two package. They can just fit two package in one page, uh, which is is four, four kilobytes. And but what we, we sort of kept of requirement is that. This memory must be contiguous physical memory uh, that, that the, this package gets, gets delivered in. And you have to have some headroom, and you also have to have some, some, some tail room. When this gets transferred into the network stack, we need extra room in, in the end of the packet to, to have something called the SKB shared info section, uh, which is also a requirement for the driver, how they have to lay, lay out this uh, memory requirements. So one of the other uh, big, one of the other issues not not supported issues right now is we are not splitting frames uh, across multiple pages. So if you're uh, really in love with jumbo frames, uh, you might be out of luck uh, for now. Um, yeah, for now we, we are not supporting jumbo not, frames. Not support that. It's it's complicates things and it, it's uh, so we, we could could like do have a big higher order pages for for jumbo frames, but then then we you you have, you have slowed down the the. Uh, the, the, the normal normal use case of XTP just to support bump, jumper frames. We have a question. Where? No, you're not allowed to ask questions. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're not allowed to ask questions. We just don't get, have more time. Box. It was just him. It wasn't. What about GRO or other technologies that amalgamate two so frames? Th this, this happens before the GRO step, so this, this is really not a, a non-issue because it happens later. So the, the network stack does GRO. So if it gets passed onto a network stack, it can coil up these packets. But that's in native mode. What about in SKB receive mode? Of several frames earlier. It's, 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 we don't have time, so I, I can explain it offline. Uh, <laughs> Punt. Table, table to yeah, later. Yeah, we are. Abor XDB aborted. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so we, we, what I recently added, I, we have sort of have now have a pluggable model for, for, for the, the, the receive queue, so you can have another memory model per, per receive queue. And we're using that actually to get this, the zero copy mode uh, in the AF, AFXDP. Um, and there's an opportunity to, to, to share this allocator code between the different drivers. And uh, I'm going to work on that next week. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are actually out of time. Uh, we, are, we are told there's a strict requirement. Yes, we are. Uh, apparently, yeah. the wall's coming yeah. down. So, um. so thank you. And this is uh, actually a combined effort of, of many people. Thanks.